Okay, so we can wait three more minutes. Or four more minutes. Two, two more minutes. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure it looks it looks good. Yeah, it looks good. Yeah. That's good. Are you still there, Susanna? Yeah, I do. Obviously. Yeah, because, yeah. Yeah, I do. Here, I can wait two, three more minutes for everybody to come. I hope everyone will be able to find the right link. Sorry. Yeah, so I think you can get started. Okay. Let's see. Yeah, if we get more people, we can get more people, but yeah. that's okay. So we can do. So every hello everybody, I welcome you again with a new new webinar organized by Confocal and uh, Fluorescent Laboratory at the uh, Charles University here in Vinchina. And our speaker today is uh, Zdenek Schwendrich from Dartmouth College, Hanover, New Hampshire, USA. And he will speak about DNA paints and single molecule localization to parallel microscopy. Uh, Dr. Schwendrich is, uh, is a former student of Charles University and he spent his postdoc at the University of Virginia for three years he was there and uh, after that he moved to uh, Dartmouth College in New Hampshire when he is leading fluorescent microscopy and confocal microscopy or like light, light microscopy center and all the equipment that they do have there for that and um, thank you Snake for accepting this uh, presentation and I'm giving it the board. Okay, thank you, Zuna. Hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me, see me, and you can see my presentation as well. So, uh, so some of you may have seen my presentation last week, where I covered um, just basics of fluorescence microscopy and fluorescent labeling strategies. Uh, and this time, I will I will focus on on one of those I have mentioned very briefly. Uh, called the DNA paint. It's one of the single molecule localization super resolution microscopy techniques. Uh, yeah, so yeah, last week I totally forgot to tell you just very few brief things about Dartmouth College because even I haven't heard about it before before I, 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 I got a job here. So, so it's basically in the middle of nowhere, somewhere between Vermont and, uh, and New Hampshire. And yeah, the only thing that's around are woods, woods, and woods. That's also great because the coronavirus didn't get here yet. But uh, yeah, maybe maybe eventually. Um, winters are great, very cold and a lot of snow. And uh, back to microscopy, uh, uh, we do have some, some decent uh, microscopy equipment in our shared facilities as well. So we have point scanning confocal microscopes, spinning disks, we have some, some super resolution machines available as well. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's a nice quiet corner of the world. So back to the business. So uh, I will say something about the resolution limitations in microscopy so we can move on to super resolution microscopy and and then specifically to to dna 
paint. So, uh, so to bring everyone to the same page, let me quickly review the two key concepts in, in light microscopy. And that's resolution, the ability to resolve objects that are close to each other. And of course, uh, the, the noise, the signal to noise ratio, the contrast of, of what you are looking at, basically ability to see the structures you're interested in on top of your background or, or whatever microscopy modality you're using. Uh, and I will be talking exclusively about fluorescence because it's the most powerful contrasting method. It really allows you to observe single fluorescent molecules in your sample. And uh, that's, uh, that's, that's a great advantage of, of fluorescence. Uh, of course, the resolution, as we all know, is governed governed by by diffraction of light, and um, uh, of course, the other thing that becomes uh, important is also labeling density when when we want to get down to uh, the nanometer scale. And uh, the signal to noise ratio is governed governed by the other property of light. It's not only a wave; it's also a particle and they simply come from your sample to your detector as individual photons, and that comes with its own photon counting noise, which is unavoidable. And these, both these concepts are, are very relevant to single molecule localization microscopy. Um, so very briefly, the, the, the re resolution can be understood either in real space or in something that we call Fourier space or also fancy word, spatial frequency space. Uh, the, the Fourier transform and frequency space, they are not really critical for understanding single molecule localization. So I won't go into detail on this, but uh, uh, simply phenomenologically uh, put, the objective does some uh, filtering of of your of your image image uh, data simply when you look through through an objective everything looks a little bit blurred and that's because uh the the objective which actually performs for a transformation limits some clears some information outside of this small region this is the region where your in useful information uh, is contained and that the region, unfortunately, is limited by the numerical aperture. It's actually exactly an uh, uh, analogy of this little back focal aperture in your objective lens. And since uh, 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 numerical aperture cannot be arbitrarily large, we are limited by the index, refractive index of, of your sample and most media or, or most transparent materials have refractive index 1.5 that's also the, the the limit of of uh, numerical aperture that we can use and that limits our resolution in, in real real space it uh, it might be more instrumental but still there is uh, there's no like um, a trivial or explanation how the how the resolution is really limited uh, but both the frequency domain and the, the real space treatments, uh, if one does the math, like Ernst Abbe did uh, 100 years ago, uh, the resolution limit of uh, standard fluorescence microscopy is lambda over 2 and A. And lambda is the wa wavelength of light, which is typically around half a micron. Uh, so the resolution limit is in the in the state-of-the-art microscopes is, let's say, 200 nanometers. And you can't really resolve structures that are significantly smaller than that. Um, unless you turn to super resolution techniques, which are, which are trying to bypass this, this resol resolution limit. Uh, let me quickly review the... Uh, concept of point stretch function and image formation. Basically, if you look at the, any su sufficiently small object in your microscope, that means smaller than resolution limit, let's say smaller than 100 nanometers, what you will see is uh, uh, a blurry representation of, of this ob object, and that's called the point spread function. It's the function of the machine. It's not really uh, related to your sample. It's simply how the light diffracts in your microscope and how the resolution is limited. 
and then naturally, um, um, if you have a sample, uh, you can think of each part of the sample being replaced by this point spread function, which leads to your resulting blurry image. Of course, in reality, uh, samples are three dimensional and this point spread function as illustrated here is not symmetric it's much more extended in z direction in the depth direction so that's that's why when you do the uh, image formation thought experiment you simply also uh, there's a fancy word for it convolution um, uh, or simply replacing every little point of your nice sharp sample with the point spread function, you get blurry representation of, of, your, of your sample. This can be undone to some extent uh, with uh, deconvolution, right? That means undoing this convolution process. But uh, yeah, for some samples, it, it simply doesn't work. And uh, there is a risk of artifacts. Uh, of course, single molecule localization microscopy will have artifacts on its own. Um, but it really lets you improve the resolution dramatically. Uh, so before uh, just getting uh, deeper into the principle of single molecule localization, here is a short list of how people call their techniques. Uh, I, I prefer this term single molecule localization microscopy. It's not the, the most... Uh, <laughs> uh, like it, it's not more the, the, the best sounding uh, shortcut or acronym, but people uh, call it differently. You, I'm sure you know these, these uh, terms like palm and storm, which stand for photo activation light microscopy and storm is just some stochastic optical reconstruction microscopy. These are uh, the old original names of those techniques. And the distinction uh, historically was that Palm was done with photoswitchable proteins, and Storm was done with, with just other dyes that, uh, that tend to be suitable for single molecule localization microscopy. There are other uh, more uh, exotic uh, names, you know, SPDM from uh, Christoph Kramer's uh, work, GSDIM, that's Lycas term, ground state depletion with individual molecule return. That's, uh, that sounds, sounds amazing, doesn't it? And paint, which I will focus on, uh, which stands for point accumulation for imaging in nanoscale topography. And these, all these techniques, and there is many more, and you can name your own method, uh, and maybe maybe it will be famous. Um, uh, they all rely on the single molecule localization principle. Uh, they just are trying to use different tricks to. To, to decompose your sample into uh, the image of your sample into single molecule images, uh, which we term also blinking for the, for, the, for the original single molecule localization techniques. So, so briefly, how it works, this localization microscopy. Um, if you imagine you have your sample, it looks like this, nice and sharp and because it's tiny when you look at it through a microscope you can see a blurry representation of it because because some features like this tiny eye are actually below the resolution limit of your microscope um, so if on the other hand you are able to turn on individual fluorescent microscope uh, individual fluorescent mi molecules of your sample on uh, in somehow randomly in this case in such a way that they don't overlap really that means you take a series of images and these will be hundreds or thousands of images and uh, your molecules will simply be blinking in such a fashion that there won't be any that, that there won't be many of them on at the same time uh, so they don't overlap. Uh, in this case, you can really find the center of each of those blinking events, and that means localizing this molecule to a high precision. If you imagine that uh, the the width of this blurry blob is, let's say, 200 nanometers, you might be able to find the the center of it, the center of gravity, or the different different measures of where the molecule is really located. 
with much higher precision. And then if you plot these coordinates together from the series of thousands of images, you can get the super resolution image, basically just plotting coordinates of th those individual molecules. And uh, the re resolution enhancement is, uh, is really dramatic. Um, of course, uh, there will be noise contribution as well. You can imagine if, if your blinking even looks like this, there's basically no background, no noise in this image because these are very bright blinking molecules. Or oh, there's there's tiny background here, but you probably can't really see it very well. You can you guess that the, the localization precision will be pretty good. On the other hand, if your molecule, if your single blinking events images look something like that, it's much harder to determine where exactly the the center of this molecule is. Simply the localization precision uh, is is worse. I won't go into the math. I showed this equation just for illustration you know it's statistics i, I won't really pretend I, I understand what's going on there but the important thing is that your final resolution of course th that's the precision of localization that that basically means the the, the resolution of your super result image will depend on the result the regular regular resolution of your microscope that, that's the abbey limit let's say 200 nanometers and of course, it will also depend on number of captured photons from each event. Because if you have weak events where you have very few photons captured, you don't really get too much extra information. If you only capture one photon from your blinking molecule, you're, you're lost. The, the technique doesn't work. Typically, you need to get something like 1,000 thousand photons or tens of thousands of photons to make this technique work really great. And the other contribution in this equation, which I normally say that you can kind of disregard it, you cannot disregard it when it comes to, to DNA paint or other paint flavors of super resolution microscopy. And that's the background in your image. It's the background that comes from the out of focus light from your sample. And uh, that kind of background comes with its own photon counting noise and it also degrades the resolution uh, dramatically if you cannot uh, eliminate this background. So I, I will touch this topic of background in, uh, in those uh, paint images a couple of times because it's, uh, it, uh, it, it has been uh, one of the limitations of the paint techniques, uh, resolved to some extent already. And uh, yeah, the, um, uh, actually, William Murner was was one of the three guys who got the Nobel Prize in 2014. So, so his work was on single molecule blinking, and he's at the origin of, of of these single molecule localization techniques. Okay, now the million dollar question is: How do we make those molecules blink? Uh, Somehow it happened that someone just observed that if you shine strong enough light on your sample, it looks like these individual molecules start blinking. That means what they do, uh, some of them, um, instead of getting excited uh, by absorbing your excitation light and emitting photon a couple nanoseconds later and doing that over and over again, what they do that they actually can go into some kind of dark state, which may be different different thing for different uh, fluorescent molecules it may be triplet state or some chemically enhanced chemically stabilized dark state where they simply disappear they are not fluorescent anymore they don't ab absorb your fluorescent light so you can't see them and if you manage to turn off all your molecules then you can't see any fluorescence right um, and then if randomly some of the molecules uh, relax back to the ground state they are ready for uh, number of cycles of excitation and emission and they produce a burst of light and if uh, if you pick a good dye like a alexa 647 you do some tricks with your buffer to make sure there's no oxygen and uh, you know the right re reducing environment and things like that you can really efficiently turn off most of the molecules and from the blinking ones you can get on the order of ten thousand photons 
per individual blinking event, which in theory would give you a hundred times improved resolution. Of course, there are other other limitations. So you, but you can get to twenty nanometers if uh, if you are really trying hard. Uh, twenty nanometer resolution, um, which is great. Uh, the, the the bad thing is that it only works great with some of the dyes and uh, and not others. So there are limitations in terms of uh, multicolor imaging and also the strong light. Um, it's hard to do. Uh, live cells because they may not like your strong life light and also the fact that you still need to capture uh, thousands of images which takes some time again it's it's very challenging when it comes to live cells so that's that's the that's what's behind the storm microscopy now the palm uses uh, uses different approach they use photo switchable fluorescent proteins uh, somehow um, by by mutations people observe that some some mutated fluorescent proteins tend to turn on or off depending on what kind of light you shine at them and now there's a number of uh, of nice fluorescent proteins of course they are much dimmer than the small molecules like alexas you can get like thousand photons per per burst and uh, the other thing is that some of those proteins will simply die after thousand bursts and you know they are dead and uh, you won't be able to localize that molecule again whereas here the molecule after 10000 photons it may go again into dark state and be ready for for another 10000 photons sometime later so uh, the palm with fluorescent proteins typically the resolution is is poorer because um, the, the molecules are not as bright and not as great in blinking. And even though it sounds like uh, you can do it in live cells, because those are proteins expressed in live cells, um, live cell imaging is very challenging for the same reasons. You know, the cells won't like strong light and uh, it takes long to acquire a sufficient number of images. So it's really very challenging when you want to do that in live cells. But it's it's been done, and in fi in fixed cells, it's it's one of the standard uh, single molecule localization techniques. So, and there are a number of other approaches uh, how to make your molecules blink. But now I will I will narrow our focus to the paint methods, point accumulation for imaging in nanoscale topography, uh, as they came up. Uh, with this acronym in 2006 so it's it's not new thing it's it's pretty old thing and it was uh, just this um, uh, lucky observation of, of this group in 2006 when they labeled uh, a small lipid vesicles with nile red they saw that the vesicles are blinking that's kind of this trace the random blinking of, of one vesicle over time so what was happening there um, the nile red actually is not fluorescent when it's in water probably because it's it aggreg aggregates or there might be other other things um it, and it's also very lipophilic and it becomes probably 100 times more fluorescent when it's in non-polar environment that means if it interacts with the lipid bilayer of the vesicles it becomes much brighter and that's what's causing these fluctuations. And uh, basically, if you you're labeling, if you if the concentration of these molecule is just the right one, you can see individual molecules as they interact with those vesicles as simple, simple single blinking events. And again, you can use the single molecule localization approach, localize all these molecules over tens of thousands of frames. And this is an example of a vesicle that looks like a blob, but when you do this approach, the, you know, this paint on it, uh, localize all the molecules, you see it's actually two small uh, lipid vesicles. Uh, so uh, again, something like 30 nanometer resolution would be, could, could be achieved here. And yeah, the great advantage is that, uh, as I mentioned, when the molecule, when the Nile Red is in the solution, and there will be million, billions of those molecules floating around in water, they are not strongly fluorescent, so they 
contribute to some background, but not overwhelmingly. Um, and that will be uh, also important in some of the future methods, because this is cool, but uh, is it really useful for anything else than Nile red and lipid vesicles, right? Not, not everyone is really studying Nile red and, uh, and lipid vesicles. Well, it turns out that um, um, soon after, actually in, in 2010, uh, this universal paint, you paint method was published. It's a, it's a small step towards more uh, generally useful uh, paint, paint imaging method. And um, how this works is uh, in this cartoon, they use two approaches. Um, either they just conjugated antibody like we would normally do in a, in a immunofluorescence experiment, or they actually also use HISTEG with uh, NTA interaction. That's one of the strong interactions um, that's uh, used in, in biochemistry. And again, they made a fluorescent NTA uh, construct uh, or analog that then can bind to some proteins that are fused with this little uh, HISTEG. The HISTEG is only six histidines, so it's very, very tiny and easy to work with and the cells uh, you know, they won't object against this. Um, and then, of course, because uh, here that's what's happening in the cell, there's a solution with a lot of these uh, fluorescent molecules. They call them non-fluorescent, but they are actually fluorescent. They are just not being Im illuminated because this scheme only works in uh, high-low, that means the highly inclined illumination, or in turf, where you really are illuminating only a couple, 100 nanometers away from the cover slip. Uh, so th that way, the high low illumination, the highly inclined um, uh, illumination, makes sure you are not exciting the whole volume of fluorescent molecules because you wouldn't be able to see anything. Uh, and that's one of the limitations. You can't really go deeper in the cells. This high low is not a great technique. It works usually, but you are limited in how deep you can do in, uh, go in your sample. And it's very similar, very similar to turf. So this way, uh, uh, you can study um, whatever proteins or um, um, you know receptors on on the surface of living cells, which is great. And some of the results are are here. Um, um, for example, they can they can map uh, the diffusion of receptors on the surface of the cells and find very important information about the, the bio biology of those of those receptors. Um, yeah, so this this turns to be a, a useful useful technique. Again, you can target any anything you want because you can use uh, immuno like antibody based labeling as long as it's on the cell surface. Um, yeah um and yeah the other thing is uh, uh there is another advantage that in principle you can uh, remove those fluorescent molecules from the solution and float in another set of molecules with different antibodies and this way study multiple targets on your on your cells sequentially and uh, but that, that was that was also perfected in, in some of the later techniques. Uh, and now comes the DNA paint. Uh, so what it is, it is also a 2010 technique. Um, Ralph Jung, Jungmann from, from Germany uh, was one of the who was the first author on, on this uh, very nice work where basically it's the same principle, the same paint principle that you have a lot of floating fluorescent molecules and they, and they only briefly interact with your target. Uh, so these molecules are now, because it's now based on DNA-DNA interaction, so these are called uh, imager strands and these are called the docker strands. Um, whenever uh, these fluorescently labeled uh, short um, short primers, short sequences of DNA bind to, to the one that uh, is linked to a target. Uh, they are immobilized there and uh, they appear as a blinking event. 
they are fluorescent all the time, but because they are stuck here and not moving, you can you can you can think of it as as a on blinking event. Again, you rely on not really seeing all these molecules floating around. That's why this also uh, works best in turf. And these are some turf images or uh, turf images of um, of DNA. Uh, origami structures, some 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 DNA structures that did contain those uh, short oligo sequences uh, that was uh, that were supposed to bind these fluorescent molecules. So uh, again, very very good resolution, um, but not terribly useful because not everyone just studies some DNA origami structures or things like that. Uh, people, of course, want to use it for. Or proteins, right? But this was the first demonstration where they demonstrated uh, really sub thirty nanometer resolution with this with this technique. Of course, it does work with proteins, right? Otherwise, we wouldn't be talking about it here. And this actually is two thousand fourteen. It's the same Ralph Jungmann uh, this time um, uh, at Harvard here in Massachusetts. Um, and so what they did is, uh, this is one page of, the, of their paper. If you look and zoom in on one of those tiny insets, it actually nicely depicts uh, uh, the method uh, of, the, of the DNA paint approach. Um, so it works in fixed cells uh, that you can incubate with these kinds of modified antibodies. It's an antibody linked to a short strand of DNA. And there are different ways how to do it, uh, depending um, what's your favorite chemistry. Here they did it simply, uh, they used biotinylated antibodies, which are available commercially, and also biotinylated DNA strand, which can be synthesized. And by using streptavidin in between them, the biotin streptavidin interaction is very strong and this kind of complex will Will never dissociate. So this way you tag your antibody with a short strand of DNA and then you can incubate your fixed cells with those antibodies. Those antibodies will penetrate everywhere where they bind where they, they bind where they should. And later on when you uh, add these fluorescently labeled uh, uh, strands that also can be commercially, you can buy those, right? The same way like you buy, buy regular primers for PCR, let's say, you can uh, uh, you can uh, use this DNA paint method. They will again bind br very briefly, and this will look as a, as a blinking event when they are when the fluorescent molecules are immobilized on those on those uh, on those antibody uh, DNA constructs. So, uh, and this works great, but again, it's limited to this high low or turf illumination because there are lots of fluorescent molecules floating around. Uh, the great advantage of, of, this, of this technique is, um, as you can see, for example, here, this is one of the super resolved images uh, where they used um, ADO655 to look at mitochondria, this COX5, uh, COX4, and beta tubulin using uh, green, uh, green fluorescently labeled oligos. And it does work very nicely. You get very high resolution image. Um, and the main advantage is that you have almost unlimited supply of fluorescent molecules. They bind, they can bleach, but then they will leave and more molecules from your solution can bind. So you have un unlimited number of uh, localization events. And if you're patient, you acquire enough images of these blinking events, you can get very high resolution uh, storm kind, uh, single molecule localization kind of, kind of image. Um, and the other advantage is that this can be extended to many more targets and they in this, that's actually still the same paper and they call it exchange paint because what you can do you can first incubate your sample with number of antibodies and each antibody lab labeled with a little different oligo uh, nucleotide and 
later on when you're ready to image them you can just float the uh, matching imager uh, fluorescent labeled strand uh, capture all your all your 15000s of images and uh, then wash it away and then introduce another fluorescent labeled oligo and it can be the same color because this ADO 655 is one of the good ones for this kind of approach because it doesn't bleach, it's very bright. And you can repeat it with as many antibodies as, as you can introduce into your cell. And this way, um, uh, look at multiple proteins in your cell, multiple targets, and with very high resolution. And you can avoid any kind of uh, chromatic shifts or other aberrations that typically result when you are trying to use multiple blinking uh, fluorophores of different colors so this was also uh, this is really in the useful technique where you can again target a number of structures in your cells and look at how different organelles interact in great detail uh, so this is uh, tube microtubules mitochondria golgi and, and peroxisomes uh, i guess and um, it works in 3D because you can localize the molecular blinking events in 3D. So this is like XZ view of different microtubules at different depths. And it has, uh, they, they, um, they achieve, again, sub-30 nanometer resolution in XY. So, so very nice. Uh, again, limited to high-low or turf illumination. So that's that's still one thing that uh, that people uh, that, that that's the limitation of, of these methods, but still, uh, but already very very useful. Well, the next step, which uh, um, again, it's the same. It's 2017. It's the same guy, Ralph Jung, Jungmann, and now as a group group leader back back in Germany. And he tried to do the same thing with spinning disc because spinning disc, as I tried to explain last week to some of you who at attended the lecture, it's a it's a fast method to take kind of a image. It's similar to white field microscopy, but you get some optical sectioning, actually very good optical sectioning with recent spinning disc uh, uh, machines. And again, this helps you avoid all the out of focus light, which is a strong uh, contamination here in DNA paint, as I explained, because you still have tons of uh, mole fluorescently labeled molecules floating around, and you are only trying to focus on those that bind and stick uh, for a minute. Uh, so it can be combined it works and you get the great again they were able to show great results if you if you compare the diffraction limited image and the super resolution image of some kind of uh, combination of microtubule uh, tom20 which is mitochondria and uh, hsp60 which you can't see because it's blue but it's also uh, mitochondrial localized so yes it, it works great again in fixed cells because you are it's immuno it's immunocytochemistry based uh so and it does work and it's 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 really nice you don't need high low you can do it with regular spinning disc confocals so yeah so why is why is, why isn't everyone doing it right all the oligos and those are basically available commercially now well one catch that there is there if you look at the methods uh, section of this paper they took 15,000 frames at 180 millisecond exposure. And if you take this at 11 Z planes and look at three probes, it adds up to 25 hours of, of just imaging. Uh, yeah, well, if you want your high resolution image, you, you can wait, but this is clearly not a high throughput method, but, uh, but it's, it's been demonstrated to produce uh, great images already. Uh, so, um, to solve this high background um, issue with these paint techniques, a uh, number of uh, approaches have been published. I will mention this uh, one that's called repeat DNA paint, uh, where it's a it's simple, simple trick because you are actually using a DNA strand that will bind another DNA strand you can make a number of repeats that are home that will uh, hybridize with your image strand and the idea is that then more fluorescent molecules will bind to your target and make uh, the process better and indeed 
they they were able to show in this it's still not published it's it's only preprint but they were able to show that um, you can then use either 10 times lower concentration of of your image strands in the in the buffer so that means the all the background issue is attenuated by a factor of 10 or you can use the same amount but image faster and this factor of 10 is already very very important and very interesting still better method uh, uses fluorogenic uh, probes because that's that's actually the golden gra the, the the holy grail of this of all the dna paint methods or all the paint based methods if you have a fluorogenic probe that will be only fluorescent when it binds to your protein then it's it's exactly what you want because you have infinite amount of your fluorescent molecules that are not being bleached they only are visible when they bind to your protein and you can get uh, really awesome awesome results if this works and there actually is a simple way how to do it and it's basically based on well-known technology like the pac-man uh, qPCR methods uh, which are based on these molecular beacons basically a, a stem loop uh, primer that quenches itself when it's in solution but only becomes fluorescent when uh, when bound to, to to DNA so that's that you can buy primers that are labeled with fluorescent uh, tag and a dark quencher that's uh, that's normally used in in most of the original, PCR test for coronavirus, that was the case as well, for example. Uh, but here it's used to microscopy. And to make actually the, the kinetics a little better, uh, in this paper, in this preprint, they designed their own oligos that kind of are weird because they don't match very well to, to the template. And that's intentional uh, to make sure that the binding is fast and transient. And again, they are dark when they are floating in solution and they become like 80 times brighter once, once they bind. So they already uh, demonstrated with this, with this simple approach, uh, 25 times speed improvement. And again, this is still the same fluorogenic DNA paint uh, add-on to, to those techniques. They demonstrated uh, this kind of image, which like a 2D image can be uh, taken in like 10 minutes. This is uh, the this is on the faster end of regular storm imaging and with great resolution. And yeah, it's actually a group of Jörg Babesdorf here uh, nearby at, at Yale University. So uh, this, this looks like the most promising way to Im do super resolution microscopy of multiple targets uh, in fixed cells, because this was really uh, demonstrated to be very, uh, very useful. And this is an example of the imager, which is uh, Psi 3 on one end and this black hole quencher on the other end. Again, this is the standard thing you can buy as a primer. And the Docker strand, uh, which in this case, to, to attach the Docker strand to the antibody, right? It's still immuno, um, uh, immunocytochemistry. So to do attach uh, this uh, DNA to your antibody, they used click chemistry. Again, you can, uh, there are chemicals you can buy that have both the azide, the click reactive end and protein reactive end, and you can, you can just conjugate your covalently label or covalently attach your DNA to uh, uh, to your to your antibody. Again, then you can incubate as many antibodies as, as you want with different different tags, different uh, oligos, and sequentially image a number of targets in your cell with the same color uh, of of your reporter. So, and I just marked in red here the like the red ones are actually mismatched bases because you really want uh, you can think of it as a very bad primer with uh, melting temperature way below room temperature because at room temp you want they, them to bind only for 10 milliseconds and, and leave or, or bleach. So uh, yeah, that was very clever. That's, that, that's one of the clever ways how to improve the DNA paint method. And also the other direction people tried is uh, trying to go back to live cells, but not only the surface, but uh, 
basically inside live cells. And that's the live paint that has already been published in 2020. It's a Scottish group. And what they tried is uh, basically use, one, one triggers to use M neon green, which is much brighter than GFP, and still it can be expressed in living cells. And uh, they used uh, transient peptide-peptide uh, peptide interactions, in this case between the Synzip 17 and 18 helices. These are sim simple helices that have like one nanometer dissociation constant, and that turns out to be a good starting point for uh, this kind of uh, paint imaging. So uh, you can express both your tagged protein of interest, you tag it with one of the helices, and then you can, uh, and that, that can be done actually in the endogenous locus. And it's very simple in, in, in yeast, right? Because they recombine just, uh, just like crazy uh, with, with any DNA you, you throw at them. If you want to do the same thing in human cells, you would probably need to CRISPR in this little peptide um, to your target of interest. And then on a plasmid, you can overexpress the M neon green with uh, with the with the other part binding partner. And again, when they bind transiently, you will see a little blinking event, and you can localize those, and uh, and get uh, get a super resolved image inside a living living cell. So the the advantage is this M neon green, which is uh, very bright, and we don't really have uh, like switchable palm style, palm style uh, dyes that would be as as bright. So that's that's uh, why this method is really better than regular palm. Uh, again, the limitation is it works only in this kind of high low or turf uh, scheme because your whole cell is full of of those M neon green molecules that will contribute strongly to the background. And uh, if you use regular white filter imaging, you won't really you won't really see see a lot. So uh, of course, um, if this if there were like fluorogenic probes available for this approach, that would be again the holy grail of, of live cell super resolution imaging. Um, but you can't just use the regular randomly switching on and off dyes. You want some uh, some fluorogenic dyes that only turn on when they bind. It's doable, and people are working on it because uh, there are many systems where, when protein binding causes the fluorescent protein to turn on. Of course, in this case, uh, the complicated thing is that you really want to use the brightest possible GFP variant and 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 tune this process very well. But I expect this uh, this this will be uh, demonstrated soon uh, with a fluorogenic probe as well. So. And this is just an example of super resolution image that you can get this way. Uh, yeah, the results in live cells are never as impressive as in fixed cells, but uh, still very useful. You can, again, like in the first uh, universal paint example where it was just the outside of the cell, you can use this to track different molecules inside the cell or on the surface or or wherever you, you choose. So yeah, another twist on these paints paint techniques. So yeah, so that's it. Uh, so yeah, in conclusion, um, yeah, in principle, the paint techniques are very interested because generally you don't need any special uh, microscopy hardware. And for some of them, you may need a stronger imaging turf or high low like illumination. But you have the Zeiss Elyra machine available in, uh, in the microscopic core in Vinichna. So, you know, that's, that's the very suitable machine for, for these kinds of techniques if anyone wants to try them. And uh, the, the key advantage of these paint techniques is that really you can, it allows you to collect unlimited number of localizations. So your probes won't just bleach out. And even if you're looking at sparse targets, you can get a lot of uh, localization events and high resolution resulting image. Uh, of, uh, of course, there are some limitation of the original paints, but the, the DNA paint then benefits from the tunability of binding uh, and dissociation kinetics between those DNA strands. 
uh, and they are very convenient to signal amplification schemes or there's a simple way to get a fluorogenic probes so uh, that's as i mentioned that looks like the most uh, promising approach now for fixed cell imaging and you can look at many many like many color experiment but you are using the same color sequentially in fixed cells and live paint advantages is uh, uh, that um, all the components can be expressed in live cells and you can avoid um, artifacts associated with the overexpression of your target because typically if you want to look at some protein in palm style of uh, of, uh, of an experiment you fuse it to your this photo switchable like m m eos 2 protein or something like that overexpress it heavily and then look what it does of course this overexpression causes artifacts on its own so this life paint uh, you don't overexpress your target you only overexpress the the fluorescent probe which which is much much better in terms of artifacts of course we are limited by the fact that we still don't have fluorogenic probes for the life life cell version but uh, i'm sure it's coming so yeah stay tuned and this 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 looks like a very exciting new method that will be uh, more widely adopted yeah so thank you for your attention and uh, please if if you you have any questions yeah hit me with your questions zana we can't hear you Thank you, Danny, for a beautiful presentation. And I'm opening the webinar to the discussion of orders. If you'd like to speak, you have unmuted your uh, microphone. 